Strategy Week continues. Welcome into Fantasy Baseball today on Wednesday, February 28th. Frank Stanfield joined by Scott White. Today on the show, we're talking snake drafts and auction slash salary cap strategy. And we have some updates on each of our great fantasy baseball invitational drafts. That's the TGFBI. But first, I want to start the show with a spring training overreaction. Are you hmm. ready, Scott? I am. All right, here it is. Shohei Otani will hit like Shohei Otani this season. <laughs> that's it. That, that's the overreaction. First game with the Dodgers, and he smokes a home run to the opposite field. It's just in such Shohei Otani fashion, right? It's, mm -hmm. I don't know. It's Yeah, and it looked like a pop-up off the bat. You know, like the way he reacted to it, it's like he didn't get it all. And the angle was so high. But it went out to the opposite field. And I mean, the fact that he hit it so high, I think is a good sign. We were talking earlier this week about how uh, Bryce Harper coming off his elbow issue had trouble ele elevating the ball at first. <laughs> Otani clearly elevated that one. His batting <laughs> practice sessions have looked great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm. This is what we wanted to see, right? In spring training, we wanted to see him pop a few homers. This is home run number one, but everything we've seen so far, I think, is cause for relief, cause to ease concerns you may have about his effectiveness coming off that elbow procedure. Doesn't change that he's DH only, and that makes for a makes for a difficult build using such an early pick on that spot, but. He should be super productive. That's my leaning. I mean, I guess that was everybody's leaning all along, right? There's yeah. a reason why he's a first rounder or early second rounder at worst. Yeah, it's just so interesting that the ADP is typically late first, early second round. I get that he's coming back from the elbow surgery. Last year, Shohei Otani finished as the seventh overall player, and that was in just 135 games. He was actually yeah. the best hitter version of Otani we have ever seen last year. So it could take some time. Again, it's I'm being a little bit facetious, you know, overreacting to one game, but it would not surprise me at all if Otani performs like a top five player this year, especially in that lineup, the counting stats, power, speed, all that kind of crazy stuff. And, and like I said on the podcast earlier this week, I like the fact that he's not pitching this year. He could just focus on hitting and some of that injury risk that you get in a year when he's pitching, you know, it's kind of, double the risk anything can happen with your arm obviously that'll uh that'll probably stop him from being a hitter we don't have to worry about that this year so I, I it has it hasn't stopped him from being a hitter in the past but yes i i get what you mean yeah all right so uh that's my overreaction let's talk about some snake draft strategies scott and the biggest difference between a snake draft which i think most people listening play in and an auction is that you are restricted based on where you're drafting in the first round we'll talk about auctions later on but in that format you can get any player you desire. It does not matter. If you want Ronald Acuna and Shohei Otani and Fernando Tatis, you can do it. You're going to have some really bad players at the end of your roster. But if you want to do that, you can in that format. In a snake draft, you can't do that. You know, maybe you really want Mookie Betts or Kyle Tucker. If you have the 11th or 12th pick, guess what? You're probably not getting either of those players. So I actually prefer to play in auction, Scott. Salary caps, as also known as... Um, yeah, again, where you can get whatever player you desire, kind of form whatever kind of strategy you want in that format. Uh, which do you prefer, snake drafts versus versus auction salary cap? Oh, there's nothing like a good auction. There's, I, I there's agree. nothing. It's, I agree. The idea that you can get whoever you want, well, technically true. It's it's true for everybody, and I've noticed that everybody tends to want the same players, like the the players you are obsessing over day and night are generally the same players other people are obsessing over day or night day and night and certainly me being in the role i am people here who i obsess about about day or night so it, it tends to rub off on people i don't know maybe maybe it's maybe that specific problem is more specific to me or people like me i don't know but putting that aside even even if you're leaving out the idea that you can get whoever you want in an auction. It's the the experience of going through it is just 
an absolute thrill ride. A white knuckle experience where you are going to go, you're going to have extreme highs and extreme lows in emotion, inevitably, inevitably. And it's just a great way to spend four plus hours. It really is. So I, that would be my preference. It's not always practical because it takes four plus hours and it's four plus hours of everybody's undivided attention. So it's, it's, it's not something busy people with busy lives can always make work, but if you can make it work, I think it's worth it. I think it's the better way to go about it. And, um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully you end up getting all the players you want to. Especially if you can manage to do an auction in person with everybody together, which I realize is even harder to accomplish. But, I mean, it is amazing. And I've got uh, an auction coming up this weekend, NL Only Labor. I'm going to be in a room with 11 other people that are also doing that same draft. And it's just the emotion, the psychology, and staring people down that you're you know bidding against it's it's really really fun so i would highly recommend doing that if you can actually next tuesday night right here live on youtube we're gonna could be going to be doing a live auction and uh you'll get to see us all together kind of uh i guess getting crazy and and strategizing i just made that word and, up and and since we started doing that auction live this is memorial memorial magazine league we're talking about a 12 team roto league since we started doing that auction live and i've had to divide my attention between my plan and entertaining all of you it hasn't gone as well frank it's tough <laughs> it hasn't gone as well gosh imagine <laughs> me trying to host this thing and oh gosh it's it's uh, gonna be fun so again you can check that out next week let's get back into snake drafts though scott and I, I think what you need to focus on most here with this format is how to utilize ADP, right? Average draft position. And ADP is a tool. It's not perfect, and it shouldn't be treated that way. But it's a reference point, and it's something that can help us throughout our drafts. And knowing ADP, I think it allows you to maximize your team's profit potential, right? So, mm -hmm. for example, if you love a player like, I'll just give you a mid-round player, Xander Bogarts, right? knowing that his ADP is 97.2 around pick 100, that means you don't have to take him in the fourth or fifth round, right? If you really want him, you kind of have an idea of where he's going to go. Okay, I can take him in the seventh or eighth round just based on his ADP. Now, on the other side of that, it, it can be a bit of a slippery slope because remember, ADP is exactly that. It's an average, right? And there mm -hmm. are players, there are hype guys every year that uh, they start to climb up draft boards, right? Someone like, you know, Royce Lewis has an ADP around 65. If someone really likes Royce Lewis, they can pull him up the board by a round or two, right? So how do you balance something like that, Scott? How do you utilize ADP in a snake draft setting? Well, me specifically, I bake ADP into my rankings so that not, not that my rankings are ADP, but like I did with Cole Reagans uh, at some point this off season, I originally had him as my number 11 pitcher. I saw ADP had him uh, around 25th, maybe even 30th at starting pitcher. So I said, okay, ranking him 11th at starting pitcher is going to cause me to reach for him much earlier than I need him. I still want him. So I'm going to rank him higher than ADP, but I don't need to rank him that much higher than ADP. So I, I make adjustments within my rankings to better correlate with ADP. And that way I don't even have to consult ADP when I'm drafting. I can just, I can just go off my rankings, specifically my tiers and, um, and ADP is already factored in. Now that's for the average draft, probably the sort of draft, the average sort of approach the average listener should take with their draft. I have noticed though, uh, just in the last year or two, in those NFBC drafts, uh, which I know I'm talking to a small percentage of the audience, but those those high stakes NFBC drafts, I noticed they tend to follow ADP much much closer. Specifically, on the NFBC site, you can you can uh, adjust ADP to a certain time period. If you look at the just the last week of ADP, so all the latest adjustments for those hype players you were talking about. 
They follow it very closely. So for those drafts, I've actually uh, picked out where I'm looked at where I'm picking. So you know, I'm let's say I'm picking let's say I'm picking first overall. My first pick's obviously going to be Ronald Acuna number one, but picks two and three are going to be thirty and thirty one. Picks three and four, sixty and sixty one. Picks uh, five and six, ninety and ninety one. And I look at ADP and the players going within a ten pick range of that. And I jot down ahead of time who I can reasonably expect to take. Three, like four to six players I can reasonably expect to take with each of those picks. So that I have an idea realistically what my team can look like. And that helps me it helps me decide um who to prioritize when because I see what my options are at that position or among the players I like later in the draft. And of course, that is a lot easier to do in a slow draft, which is what we're currently doing right now. The right. But even if it's a fast draft, I do it beforehand. Yeah. Yeah. So and, and a good point with that, Scott, is every website, every draft room is different, right? Depending on if you play in on CBS or NFBC, ESPN, Yahoo, wherever you play, I would say before your draft, go into the draft room, study the rankings, see what the ADP is like and come up with a, I guess a general plan, like a loose plan. I mean, guess have like targets and ideas of, okay, what rounds can I expect to take some of these? You don't want to be too rigid because obviously things are going to change and, and your players are going to get taken. And, and so you don't want to, you don't want to be uh, too strict to that. And, and then it kind of just throws off your entire draft, but where, wherever you play, go into that draft room beforehand and take a look and just get an idea for a feel of the draft room and, and ADP and rankings and, and the way things uh, look in there as well. One other thing I would say about ADP, Scott, is the deeper you go into a snake draft, the less ADP matters. For example, Jackson Churio's ADP on Fantasy Pros is 152, but I've seen drafts where he goes top 100, sometimes mm -hmm. because of you. <laughs> he really yeah, I'm, I'm often but, the one taking him there, yes. But it, I think it gets more unpredictable the later you go, right? And mm -hmm. especially with like starting pitchers, right? Anyone going outside the top 200 or 250, I mean... They can go 50 picks higher. They can go 50 picks later. So, yeah. And like the further you go yeah. into the draft, you're you're less beholden to ADP. I would say. And again, that that plan I laid out, where you ahead of time go through and and pick out who you can reasonably expect to take it with each of your picks by ADP. That's more for just NFBC high stakes leagues where people follow it that closely. Your home league people are probably not going to pay that much attention to ADP. So the hype guys, if you are all in on a hype guy, uh, you, you're probably the one who needs to, uh, you you need to go more by your own ranking of him probably than ADP, like a Jackson Chorio. Uh, in, in most of our leagues we do for CBS, because there's not a strict adherence to ADP in those leagues. Jackson Chorio tends to go within the top 100 picks, even when I don't take him. So, yeah, I, I would say in most cases, in most leagues, especially home leagues, ADP is more of a reference than a template. And you should value your own impression of a player over ADP, but use ADP as a guide for how long you could realistically wait. It's it's a judgment call, obviously, because you have to weigh the prospect of losing him to uh, against not wanting to overpay for him. And one other tip I would recommend in a snake draft is if you are drafting anywhere near the ends, right? If you have a top three pick or even a top four pick or, you know, pick nine through 12, whatever it might be, use the teams drafting after you on the ends as a way to decide some of your picks, right? Mm -hmm. Let's just say you're debating between an outfielder and a starting pitcher. And you look, you're, you're picking 10th in your draft. You look at team 11 and 12, you notice, okay, they are already loaded with outfielders. I can take the starting pitcher I want. And not that it means the outfielder will definitely come back, but it gives you a little bit more of an idea. Okay, will this player come back to me? And you can use that for different positions you know, if the players, that, uh, the teams after you have a catcher and you want a catcher, you can say, all right, I could maybe afford to wait till the next turn here because I know the teams after me have a catcher. And so, you know, that involves doing a little bit more handiwork within the draft and it could become a little bit stressful, Scott, but it, it's mm -hmm. something that I have 
used to my advantage before as well. I've used it to my advantage before too. I think it's, I think it's it's worth doing when you're picking close to the end. I it, it is it is always amusing when you you do that. You say, okay, I the next two guys have filled their outfielders, so I can I can pass on the outfielder for now because I know he'll get back to me. And then he doesn't. Like yeah, they, exactly. they take the outfielder anyway for their bench or whatever. Happens. That happens sometimes. It and, does. And it's so you can't you can't be totally sure it's gonna go according to plan when you do that. But it is it is uh it is worth considering at least. Let me also say because I think this is probably my biggest point regarding snake drafts and longtime listeners, it, it won't be anything new for them. But I, I mean, the main piece of advice I could offer beyond ADP is to print out my tiers, my position by position tiers, because th that I think gives you the perfect blueprint to follow in a draft and you can adjust them to your own preference. I have no problem with that. I don't, I don't, I'm a big believer and I don't know actually that much. <laughs> so if if you have a if you have a strong disagreement with me about a player and want to put him in a different tier, totally fine. But the idea is uh if if you wait until the idea is if you're crossing the names off as the draft is going, then it'll become clear to you what position you should target when your pick comes up because the the pick whose active tier is closest to depletion is the one that's about to see a big drop off in, in projected output. And so that's the one to target. If, if, if the active tier at one position has six names there still, and at another position, it has two, you take the position where there are two names. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's harder to say if you're picking at the end and you have to wait a long time between picks, you can't follow the tiers as strictly, but if you're picking in the middle, which is generally where I prefer to pick. Obviously, this year, if you have the choice, you're taking Acuna number one. But generally speaking, I prefer to pick in the middle. Um, and that's because I, I think the tiers approach is more reliable. And I've I've always found that to be the most successful approach, particularly in shallower leagues. The, the deeper the leagues get, I think the less important it is because you're always going to have weak spots. But in shallower leagues where you really have to be you really have to maximize your output at every position. You're, you're going to want to follow the tiers approach, I would say. Tiers 2.0 is up on the site right now. There will be a tiers 3.0, and eventually there will be a tiers 4.0 where it's just a nice, neat sheet like this that you could print out. Very Until nice. Until then, you'll have to make the sheet yourself <laughs> because they like to split the each position into its own column. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, no, I think it's a good piece of advice, and it's something I, I've done something similar in the past for drafts where I will convert my rankings into an Excel sheet where I could see every position and I'll just delete the names as they go. And you could just see like which position is getting depleted sooner. And obviously, you just react, and it's very similar to what you just said with your tears. Let's take our first break. When we return, what is our favorite pick this year? Obviously, first overall. What about outside of first overall? We'll talk about uh, that right after this. The madness doesn't just happen. Yo, get ready! And although it's marked on our calendars each year, it's built by moments of mayhem before. And the crowd goes crazy! And it begins to bubble long before it bursts. Sure, madness and marks may go hand in hand, but it starts right here. Welcome back in. What is our favorite pick in drafts this year, assuming a 12-team league? Well, first overall pick. We all want Ronald Acuna. We'll figure the rest out after that. Scott, which pick are you most excited to get this year? And does it change depending on format? It might change depending on format. I have to say in a Roto League, or any kind of categories league, I would say, any kind of 5x5 five five categories league, I want a top four pick. Like, if I can't get Acuna at number one, I want Bobby Witt at number two. And then I want Julio Rodriguez at number three. And then I want Corbin Carroll at number four. And I know we don't all agree about Corbin Carroll at number four. But I think those four players is a caliber of Roto player that we've never really seen before. You have to go back to the years of, like, Eric Davis and early Barry Bonds when he was stealing a ton of bases to find players who can hit like this and also put up a ridiculous number of stolen bases. We have seen, obviously, these odd 40-40 years in the past, 
but as they were happening, it was like, okay, this 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 player is clearly pushing for 40, 40, clearly pushing to get those 40 stolen bases so that he can have this milestone on his record. And it wasn't like the next year we were predict predicting them to go 40, 40 again. Because of the changes to the stolen base environment, the rules uh, implemented to encourage more stolen bases last year, we can expect this to continue for these players. Um, <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Ronald Acuna, 40 home runs and 70 steals, right? No, nobody had ever done that before. He became the third player to have 30 homers and 50 steals in a season. And then same year, Bobby Witt almost became the fourth. He was just one home run shy, right? Or was it one stolen base shy? One stolen base. Yeah. One stolen base shy. And then it also, Corbin Carroll, this doesn't get mentioned. His 25 homers and 50 steals. That was only the second time a player has done that in a season since Barry Bonds in 1990. So that was equally historic to what Ronald Acuna, well, nothing, nothing equals Ronald Acuna, but um, Ronald Acuna obviously setting the new standard for that and Bobby Witt almost doing that very historic thing. So yeah, this like getting one of those guys at the top of your draft is such an advantage in Roto Leagues this year that I think it's a must. And you, you worry about the rest of the rounds as they happen. In a point-scoring league, those guys aren't even two, three, and four for me. In fact, Bobby Witt and Julio Rodriguez are more like the end of round one because of their plate discipline issues. So it's not as important where I pick other than Ronald Acuna at number one in a point, points league. Uh, as for what's my favorite in that format, I might opt more toward the end of round one because you can get two first round caliber bats that way. But I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure there's any point in the draft that I'm I'm that disappointed to get this year because the the, the the amount of first, the quality at the top of the draft is so high compared to some years. Mm -hmm. I agree completely in category leagues trying to get a top three pick for the reasons you mentioned. For me, it's top three because I do have a little bit more concern over Corbin Carroll and his past troubles with uh, the, the shoulder. But yeah, top three would be happy with that. In a points league, I, I kind of like the mid picks. If I can get, you know, five, six, seven and get one of Judge, Betts, Soto, Freeman, any of those guys, I'd, I'd be ecstatic to do that. And then... You know, you're at a point in the second round where you still wind up getting a really, really good hitter, whether it's a, a Rafael Devers, an Austin Riley, or a Pete Alonzo, Francisco Lindor, someone like that. So I, I'm totally fine uh, getting players like that. It, I don't really think there's a bad point in the draft, but I probably would prefer to be, I think, in the top half is, is what I've liked more so far uh, this season. While we're talking about snake drafts, Scott, let's provide a quick update on our TGFBI drafts, which is a collection of 15-team Roto Industry Leagues. We spoke about them a little bit yesterday where most of us had uh, you know, two or three picks done at that point. Again, we're competing in individual leagues. There's an overall prize. Shout out to Justin Mason. He puts us on every year. And you'll be hearing about it on other podcasts, this podcast, and you'll be seeing it all over Twitter, X, all that kind of fun stuff. Scott is picking first. I am picking 14th. What are we up to, Scott? How's the team look? So I've made seven picks and it's been, it's been a ride, Frank. It's been a ride. So obviously I was thrilled to get Acuna at number one. Uh, and then as we talked about yesterday, I went Zach Wheeler and Kevin Gosman two and three, not because that was my plan, not because I wanted to go pitcher pitcher after taking Acuna, given the advantage he gives you in all the hitting categories, but because the rest of the league went so aggressively after hitting that Zach Wheeler and Kevin Gosman were obviously the best two players left. And in a 15 team league, starting pitching tends to deplete faster anyway. So I didn't, you know, my, my goal in most leagues is to get four of my top 35. I found that's much harder to do in a 15 team league. So I, I thought since they're obviously the best ones players to take, regardless of position, and this is the format where it's hardest to, to meet my pitching needs. I'll go ahead and take them. Then and when it got back to me in round four, this is pick 60 and 61. I really wasn't thrilled with the calibers of hitters left. And Tarek Skubal was still there. Ugh. And that fried me because Tarek Skubal should not have still been there. Uh, he was still there, even though Grayson Rodriguez and Logan Gilbert had already gone. That's how far into the pitching rankings we were at that point. 
and Tarek Skubal was still there, but I'd already used my second and third pick on a starting pitcher. So I didn't think I could take him. I took Nolan Jones and Mike Trout again, uh, and Mike Trout instead. So that gives me three outfielders already and five picks. Three outfielders, two starting pitchers. That's good. Outfield is shallow. It's five outfielder league, a 15 team league. Um, n- not going to have to stress about outfield the way a lot of people are. Felt okay about the way things were going. Hated to give up Scooble. 30 more picks go by. We're at my sixth and seventh picks, uh, 90 and 91 overall. Blake Snell is still there. Now, I have Blake Snell as a bus candidate this year. He obviously hasn't signed with a team yet, so it's possible. I mean, he's eventually got to sign, but it's possible his start to the season is delayed just because he's not participating in spring training right now. Um, But 90th, 90th overall. I I updated my rankings today, and I... I dropped him down a little bit, but I think I dropped him down to 80th as like my SP 21 or 22. So even then, right. We were down to Tanner Bybee in my starting pitcher rankings. Tanner Bybee was the second best pitcher available after Blake Snell. So I guess from that perspective, I was justified in taking Tarek Tarek Skubal because if I took Tarek Skubal, and had three starting pitchers already, there's no way I could justify taking Blake Snell there. So I was happy with that. I I, I think that kind of redeemed all the decisions I'd made up to that point. Um, and then Alex Bregman in round seven. So like a hundred run, 100 RBI guy that late in the 15 team league. I, I'm feeling really good about all of it. Now there's been a massive closer run since then and closers looking pretty icky. Already yeah. here in round seven. So that's a problem. But I I I had hoped to build my uh my saves pool, my saves pool on lower end guys anyway, and on, on closers who are less who are less certain are closers because they tend to be heavily discounted. If I could get three of those guys, I'm thinking like Jose Leclerc, Jose Alvarado, and Yuki Matsui, who all three by ADP go much lower than this. Then I I feel like I, I prefer that approach to spending a sixth or seventh round pick on a closer and passing up an Alex Bregman or Blake Snell. So that I'm still hoping that works out, but it's making me a little nervous how far we're into the closer ranks already, which tends to happen in 15 team leagues. Yeah, it's tough in 15 teamers. You know, I was going to ask you, uh, do you regret, you know, I know Snell fell to a great value, but at some point you just say, Mm, I got to get my saves and, and you choose to take a closer. Yeah, I could have, I could have taken Jordan Romano there. Yeah. And, and he's a pretty safe closer. I would say, you know, he was, if, if, if Blake Snell hadn't made it there, I probably would have taken Jordan Romano with Alex Bregman. Um, yeah. Other players I was considering Nolan Arenado. I'm not, I'm not going to take Bregman and Arenado at the same with back-to-back picks there. Hassan Kim as my shortstop. I'm already in pretty good shape for stolen bases because of Acuna and Nolan Jones. So that didn't seem like a high priority either. So I, I, if, if Blake Snell ha- ha- happened to not make it to me, um, then I probably, I, I, I at least would have very seriously considered taking Jordan Romano. So I wouldn't have to stress so much over saves, but Blake Snell did make it to me. And actually when I went through and mapped out, I did the thing since this is on the NFBC side. I did the thing I was talking about where you you looked at ADP of the last week where each of your picks are and who you could reasonably expect to take. I'd hope to take Cole Reagans yeah. at the 6-7 turn because that's where he tends to go by ADP in the last week. But getting Blake Snell instead, instead not, such a, not such a bad outcome. I actually do have Snell ranked a spot ahead of Cole Reagans. So maybe I'll change soon if I'll change that soon if he doesn't sign. But for now, I do have Snell one spot ahead of Reagan's. Yeah, and that is a great tool that you brought up too. And I, I recommend for you know anyone who wants to find it, just Google NFBC ADP or go to the NFBC website and uh, click on the baseball tab and then ADP, and you could sort it by date. You could see like you know who's moving up draft boards, who isn't. You could you could sort it by if you want to look at a twelve team draft board versus a fifteen team draft board. It is a great tool, so I recommend using it to your advantage if uh, if you do so, please. So I mentioned, Scott, I'm, I'm drafting 14th yesterday's podcast. I 
let everyone know I took Bryce Harper and Austin Riley, which wasn't the most ideal start that I was looking for. Wanted more speed, maybe an outfielder if I can get it in there, but didn't work out that way. Jose Altuve fell to me at the end of the third round, which I was obviously pleased. I was looking to get one of either CJ Abrams, Randy Rosarena, or Jose Altuve at the end of the third. Altuve was the only one of those three left, so I, I quickly snatched him up. And then in the early fourth round, I took Logan Webb, which I've talked a lot about You know, this offseason. I, if I miss out on other starting pitcher values, I'm fine with him as a fallback option. Give me those innings. I know the strikeouts aren't amazing, but the ratios should be. And um, I think that you can kind of compliment him with other strikeout guys a little bit later on. Five, six turns, Scott, I dedicated to you. <laughs> <laughs> because I needed an outfielder and I needed some speed. So I took Josh Lowe, who is my yeah, baby. first outfielder. Not the most ideal situation, but uh, there are other outfielders I still like. And I, I think I can continue to fill this out. But he fit my team needs. I mentioned earlier, I took Austin Riley in the second. So need a little bit more speed. Needed that outfielder. You get that with Josh Lowe. And in the early sixth round, I was debating Zach Eflin, Jesus Lozardo. Do I take a closer? I don't have a closer yet. Was looking at Jordan Romano. Nope. Cole Reagans, baby. That's right. Yeah, maybe I, uh, I don't know. Maybe I jumped the uh, the gun, the Reagan. What round was that? Uh, early sixth round. I just. Okay. That's where I went in mine, too. Yeah. Zach Eflin, I, I feel like is the higher floor pitcher. He's fine, but I felt like Cole Reagans maybe compliments Logan Webb a little bit better. It gives you the, that big strikeout upside. So maybe I'll regret it. He doesn't have the longest track record, obviously, but uh, I'm excited. It's my first share of Cole Reagans, and, and we'll see the, the rest of the way uh, how this plays out. Want to quickly promote a few things. Our first live mock draft will be tomorrow night or tonight, if you're li listening to this on the podcast side, February 28th. So uh, you can come watch on YouTube. We'll do a little bit earlier than usual, 9 p.m. Eastern time. So come hang out. Loads of fun. YouTube.com slash fantasy baseball today. Tomorrow, live 12 team Roto mock draft here on the channel. It will be turned into a podcast as well. And uh, this weekend, Chris and I will be down at First Pitch Florida. Great event put on by the folks at Baseball HQ every year. Chris is in the AL only labor auction. I will be in the NL only one. We'll also be down at some spring trains there. I think it's the Clearwater area. So I think we're going to the Marlins and Phillies game on Friday. If anyone's in the area or if you're at the event, come say hello. Let's have some fun. Lastly, I do want to clear something up from yesterday, Scott, because in hindsight, I think we probably came off too negatively when talking about headset categories. Oh, leagues. please. I just wanted to clear the air there. Look, there's no right or wrong way to play fantasy, right? It's subjective. It's like eating a Reese's completely. <laughs> it's completely up to you. However you want to play. So, so that is fine. Admittedly, we don't play in many head to head categories or daily lineup leagues, but I still think a lot of our analysis, our player analysis is applicable, applicable in those formats. So, Mm -hmm. I apologize, and I hope that you stick with us, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> no, you should stick with us. Don't don't yeah, hold our preferences against us. We won't yeah. hold our, we won't hold your preferences against you. It's subjective. But we have our we all have our preferences. That's you know? exactly right. Uh let's let's take our final break. When we return, some quick news and notes, some quick spring training updates, and we we've got to talk auction strategy because honestly, we could do a whole podcast on just that. So we'll do that yep. right after this. We give thanks to the athletes who took big risks, who beat the odds despite being our balls because of their skin, but to change the status quo, you have to be willing. This is the month we remember. But more importantly, we dream of something bigger. Welcome back in. Let's talk some news and notes. Walker Bueller threw his first live BP on Tuesday, and let's see how his arm responds. So. Should find that out within the next few days. Evan Carter was back in the lineup Tuesday after getting hit by a pitch on his left forearm on Sunday. Craig Kimbrell expects to make his Grapefruit League debut on Thursday. That's nice to see after he left live BP with quad soreness last weekend. Andrew Abbott is battling with Nick Martinez for the Reds' fifth starter job. The other four spots are occupied by Hunter Green, Frankie Montas, Nick Lodolo, and Graham Ashcraft. Assuming health, of course. Some free agent news. Blake Snell and the Yankees discussed a potential contract on Monday. 
Juan Soto has expressed that he wants the Yankees to make the move. And obviously they are former teammates together on the San Diego Padres. Jordan Montgomery recently had an online meeting with the Boston Red Sox. They can certainly use some pitching. I know there were some comments recently from Rafael Devers about how he was upset that the team didn't make more moves or maybe invest in pitching as much. So perhaps they can write that wrong by uh, bringing in Jordan Montgomery and the giants remain a possible destination for Matt Chapman. Spring- by the way, if they did bring in Montgomery, that wouldn't impact Nick Pavetta or Cutter Crawford. Two guys we've talked up as sleepers. Some of us more than others, but yeah. they, they have a spot open beyond them that right now Tanner Houck and Garrett Whitlock are competing for. That's exactly right. Spring training standouts from Tuesday. Alec Manoa. Yikes. <laughs> I mean, we need to see something positive this spring. His first start. 1.2 innings, four earned runs, three hit by pitches. It's not what you want. Yeah, I mean, the hits and runs, that's typical spring stuff. But three hit by pitches Oof. is not something you ever really see in a stat line, uh, spring or otherwise. Certainly not over a two-inning stint like this. So, yeah. Um, th- <laughs> look. It, it could still be an early spring thing, uh, but it, it's to the point where we like this, this spring, we really need some evidence of Alec Manoa being back on track. And this was the furthest thing from that. So whatever enthusiasm I had for him as a sleeper, and it wasn't a lot. It's less now. <laughs> it's less now, I would say. And there are people waiting in the wings here. You know, they they signed Yariel Rodriguez and they've talked him up as a starter. Ricky Tiedemann, one of the top pitching prospects in all of baseball. There are names. So if Manoa does not figure this out within his next couple of spring starts, he might be on the outside looking in. Strong Braves debut for Chris Sale, which I know you love to see, Scotty. Oh, yeah. Four strikeouts over two perfect innings. The fastball averaged 94.9 miles per hour, which is up one mile per hour from last year. He maxed out at 97 in this start. So really encouraging. You know, some guys usually build up throughout spring. So it's nice to see Chris Sale is already there. You Darvish made his spring debut. He struck out three over two scoreless innings. And Darvish is coming back from a stress reaction in his elbow last year. And the recap article on MLB.com said Darvish has been fully cleared for more than two months. And he has felt no effects of the injury. And based on where he's going in ADP, Quickly pull that up. Uh, 179.6. If Darvish is healthy, that, that could be a pretty big steal. I mean, that's a big if I get that, and production has been inconsistent, but mm-hmm. I, we know that there's still a talented pitcher in there. Well, I'm less sure of that. I'm, I'm more confident there's a talented pitcher in Chris Sale, and he is going earlier by ADP, so I guess. And he's younger than Darvish too, right? Two to three yeah. years younger, I think. Yeah, I think three years younger than Darvish. With Darvish, uh, okay, so even if you want to dismiss last year because he was going through elbow stuff, fine. But the year before, he was right at a strikeout per inning. I mean, he, he's not the Darvish from earlier in his career who would average 11K per nine. It's been a two-year trend of him not being that guy anymore. And so I, I do think the upside for Darvish is limited to like the mid-tiers. I'm not saying he couldn't transcend the glob potentially, Bodhi would be on the lower end of that, I think, at a best-case scenario. If he gets back to the K-to-walk ratio from 2022 and pitches to a mid-threes ERA and a 110 or 115 whip, and mm-hmm. I think that would be, be Merrill pretty, Kelly. Yeah, that, that would be a pretty good return on investment where he's sure. going now, right? Like, pick 180. So, uh, we'll see. A lot of it comes down to health, obviously, as well for uh, you, Darvish. Frankie Montas looked good in his Reds debut. He threw two perfect innings with two strikeouts. Apparently, Sat 94 to 96 miles per hour with the fastball. And the last time we saw him healthy in 2022, he averaged 96.1 miles per hour on that fastball. So I think this is an okay starting point, but we want to see the velocity build a little bit throughout spring. But it's a good first step here for Frankie Montas. Casey Mize also returning from uh, Tommy John surgery. He made his spring debut and his velocity was up to over two miles per hour on each of his four seam splitter and slider. So I think that's encouraging, obviously, for a former top pitching prospect in Casey Mize. J.P. Sears threw two perfect innings with two strikeouts. He debuted a new sinker. He's an extreme fly ball pitcher. 
And I think perhaps a sinker would help in his arsenal. We had some relievers turn starters in action that looked pretty good. Jordan Hicks made his Giants debut, recorded four of his five outs via the strikeout. AJ Puck made his rotation debut with the Marlins. He threw two perfect innings with three strikeouts. He also threw four splitters, a pitch he has never thrown in his career. So kind of interesting. And Garrett Crochet with the White Sox, he threw one and two-thirds shutout innings, two strikeouts against the Dodgers of all teams. He struck out Shohei Otani looking and apparently hit 99 miles per hour on the fastball. Scott, all three of these names have SPARP eligibility and slight intrigue. So names to watch. Yeah, I would say so. Uh, I'm, a, I, I'm less... Oh, so what's funny is Jordan Hicks already has a rotation spot. He's the most likely to be in this role. But I think he has the least upside in this role. I mean, we don't know exactly what Crochet's upside is because he's hardly pitched in the majors, period. But he was a first-round pick. He throws very hard. And um, unlike Jordan Hicks, we haven't already seen him in the starting role. So we, we don't really know what he can do. And that makes me a little more excited about the possibilities. And then A.J. Puck, I think, I think he could potentially be a great starter, but he has a lot of competition there with the Marlins. It's a good first step, though, because it's not like Edward Cabrera. And um, there are questions in that bullpen. I, I mean, in that rotation, Trevor yeah. Rogers coming back and right. Trevor Rogers and Edward Cabrera. Neither of them is a sure to roll. I would say Braxton Garrett them... has the shoulder, too. So, mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, yeah, there is an opportunity here with AJ Puck. Let's talk auction slash slash salary cap strategy here, Scott. And we both said this is our preferred way to play. Highly recommend it. If you haven't tried it out before, please do it. It's it's very fun. Let's start with your budget. Typical auction is $260 in fantasy baseball. And one of the first questions we usually receive about this format is, how do you distribute your money? So I feel like 70-30 in favor of hitting is quite common. I'm in the process of creating my plan for NL labor this weekend. And what I like to do is look back at the previous year's winner or like the, the, the top three finishers. And that's exactly what I did. So the top three finishers in that format last year, first place was 75, 25 in favor of hitting second place was 67, 33 and third place was 73, 27. So you can see it's kind of all over the place. There's no right or wrong answer here. It really just comes down to preference, Scott. So do you have mm -hmm. um, an aim in mind? Do you do you like to go 70% hitting 30 or 65, 35? Or do you not even think about that? Yeah, I feel, but didn't we just talk about this last week? I, it's I, never I been... We, I think we did on a mailbag. Okay. Yeah, it's never been a... It's never been the way I've gone about it, saying I want to spend this much on pitching and this much on hitting, and let me come up with my plan based on that. What I do going into an auction or a salary cap draft is... I look where the scarcities are and I look at projected auction values and where I can, where I can afford to save money and still feel like I'm getting a, a, a quality option and where I'm not, where I, where I have to spend to, to get the production at the, at the level I'm looking for. And then I make out a plan that, the, that, that, you know, hinges on me spending where I feel like I need to spend and saving where I feel like I need to save and reworking the numbers, adjusting my expectations until I get it to add up to 260. And I take that with me into the draft and I try to stick to that budget more or less. You can never stick to it exactly. Sometimes you have to scrap it completely because things are just going so differently than than you expect. The way people are bidding on high end guys, um, or the way they're bidding on stolen bases, which happened in the AL only salary cap draft I did this week. Um, you you just have to you you have to make some pretty big adjustments in draft that uh, causes you to more or less abandon your strategy, but just by having a strategy, it's very easy to adjust on the fly. Okay. I wanted to spend $25 on a third baseman. I had to spend 27 instead, not the end of the world, but I have to take those $2 away from something else. And so you have, you have specific dollar amounts that you allocate to each position or do yes. you find a player you like at each position 
and then you kind of map it out that way because yeah both i i i find the player or or i guess i guess for me it's more like uh i look at the i look at the ten dollar options at third base the ones i project to go for ten dollars and there are four of them i like in that range and so okay i'm gonna plan on spending ten dollars on third base getting one gotcha. of those four guys yeah so what i like to do in a roto draft it, Roto is a little bit tougher because I feel like you can't just say, in my opinion, you can't just say, all right, I'm going to allocate this money for this position because they have to have a similar skill set, right? Like at the end of the draft, you still have to come away with a certain number of home runs and steals, right? Like sure. you don't just want to wind up with a bunch of home runs. So what I like to sure. do is I will find a specific, specific player that I like at each position. Mm -hmm. And then I will try to find a backup player that has a similar skill set to that in case I can't get that player. So, yeah, for example, Josh Lowe, let's say I'll bu I'll budget twenty dollars for Josh Lowe. I like the mm -hmm. player. I like his skill set. Mm -hmm. I will try to find a backup that's similar. Let's say a Christian Yelich, right? Someone that can hit 270, 20 ish home runs, 30 plus steals. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I will try to do that for every position. It's it's not the easiest thing, admittedly, but. For Roto, I think it's a li it's a little bit tougher because again, you, you you have to balance the categories as well as trying to budget. Yeah, them. no, I that that's true. It's it's not just about positions. It's about where where am I getting my stolen bases? And maybe Josh Lowe is somebody I really like for stolen bases this year. I like the bang for the buck on stolen base return there, and so it may be it, there may be one specific player I'm zeroing in on, and my entire strategy for that auction depends on me getting that player so i may budget a little more for him than i would otherwise and when when it, there is a situation where it all hinges on one player like that i make a backup strategy in case i don't get that player i have a second a, a plan b that i can pivot to with again every position mapped out with some different players on there who can give me stolen bases let's say and uh and that way i don't feel like i have to blow out my budget by seven dollars on this one guy that everything depends on or i'm totally lost if i backed up back off yeah and have to figure out how to compensate for that lack of stolen bases so yeah it all factors in uh getting back to the pitching versus hitting point this year of course starting pitching for me it's all about the glob and wanting to be Wanting to get a certain number of pitchers who are outside the glob, who I can actually trust their performance, and I, they can give me a good ERA, whip base, and especially strikeout base. But then when I have to go into the glob, just taking whatever values come to me and being not so particular about which pitchers I get, because that's the whole point of the glob, is that it, it's going to be kind of random what order they finish in, I feel like. so, um, So that's... How I'm making up my strategy this year with pitching is how many pitchers do I want before we get into the glob? Ideally, for me, it's four. Do I need a high end guy like a Kevin Gosman who's going to cost me? I don't have my values in front of me. I just did an AL only. So the value for Gosman was probably higher, but $25, let's say. Yeah, that's so right. Am I going to want to spend that much or am I going to be, or am I willing to settle for like a Logan Gilbert and a Justin Steele? And, uh, you know, Yuri Perez, Mitch Keller, let's say, and allocate my dollars that way. And, you know, how much, what I decide to do depends on what I'm looking to do at hitting. But the, I, but, but the point is you got a lot of spots to fill. You got a lot of spots to fill and your dollars, you can only afford so many splurges. So I feel like you have to come up with that plan going in. It's, it's just. It's it's going to be so easy to get overwhelmed if you're trying to figure it out on the fly, and to yeah. leave yourself with a hole of some kind, whether it's at a position or within a category or or whatever. Chris Towers, if he was here, you know, he <laughs> never comes up with a plan, and you know that's fine. I I can't I can't say my prospect I can't say my process is right for everybody, but I do feel like it's a very important process for me. Talk to me, Scott, about. Two, I think two of the strategies we get asked about most in this format are stars and scrubs 
and spreading the wealth, right? And mm-hmm. and there's a way to kind of play both sides of that if you want to. But uh, have you ever tried it? Does it work? Do you, can you do it in specific formats, but not others? What do you think about that? I mean, in, mixed, in standard mixed leagues, especially the shallower the league, I think Stars and Scrubs is absolutely the way. I've had the most success when I've done that. Because the scrubs aren't actually scrubs. If the format is shallow enough, the scrubs are players who uh, potentially have high end upside themselves. The waiver wire is fertile. If if those low end dollar picks don't work out, you, you have quality options to fall back on. Uh, the high end players, the studs, are the ones everybody's trying to, you know, what what's the classic fantasy baseball trade that you can never get to work anymore because everybody knows it's a bad deal. It's two for one trades. You're trading two decent players for a stud. Nobody accepts that trade anymore. Well, if you just get the studs in the first place and those are the foundation of your team, then it's like you did that already, like you traded the two decent players for the stud. But it has to be a shallow enough league that you feel confident you're going to get good options for a couple bucks and you feel confident the waiver wire will help you backfill those spots if 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 they don't work out. If it's a deep league like a 15 team roto or certainly like the AL and NL only ones I've been doing this week. Opposite end of the spectrum. That is very much spread the wealth in those AL and NL only ones. I try not to go $30 on any player because uh the the 1 2 3 dollar players in those leagues, you can't even be confident they're going to play that much. And yeah. that's that's a big disadvantage. Just getting play, just filling every lineup spot with players who are actually putting up numbers is a big part of the battle in those deep, deep roto leagues. So um, yeah, my my approach changes completely with that. If we're talking about a 12 team roto league where somewhere in the neighborhood of 350 players are rostered counting the reserve spots, which generally aren't auctioned, they're done via reserve draft later, but they're still on rosters. They're they're not on the waiver wire. That's kind of a medium depth league. Yeah. And in the past, I've had my I've I've had my most success historically doing a stars and scrubs approach in that. But I I, I feel like I feel like fantasy baseball has become much more competitive in recent years. Like just the the, the ideas and strategies have been passed around enough that the the level of competition has been raised and i'm not sure i can i haven't had as much success in recent years doing stars and scrubs in the 12 team road league where about 350 players are rostered so i'm kind of in between how i want to approach that league um kind of unsure about that a critical point though when i when when i say stars and scrubs and and really this goes even if you're not doing stars and scrubs you don't want the scrubs to be literally one dollar guys at least you don't want to budget for that because the difference between two dollars and one dollar is huge this this is the most important piece of auction strategy i can offer if you go for your max bid too early you leave yourself half a dozen one dollar spots to fill you are going to get the dregs okay you're going to get the worst of the worst because you can only win the players you nominate if anyone else like that likes that player when you nominate him, they go to two dollars, you're out. You gotta yeah. wait through a whole round of nominations to have a chance at anybody else. So you're throw you're just kind of guessing, okay, what what player is bad enough that nobody wants to go two dollars, but I'm still happy to win him. And a lot of times you're guessing wrong, even in those guys, because somebody jumps in at the dollar. You want to be the one who jumps in it for a dollar when somebody else nominates. A one dollar guy. If it's somebody you really want, just go straight to three, uh, skip two entirely, and um, that that I think is critical. That I think is critical to make sure the low dollar guys are still quality guys. Scott, talk to me about your nomination process. If there is a process there, I mean, again, I don't know that there's a right answer per se. I mean, some people like to nominate players that. They don't yep. want because they want to get money off the board, which I, I totally understand that. But there are also people mm-hmm. that will nominate players that they do want, right? To try and mm-hmm. keep people off balance, right? So uh, do you have a process or, or a strategy with nomination? Ultimately, I don't think it's the most important thing. It's it's the sort of thing you could stress about too much. 
I, I don't think it's that big of a deal. I, I, I think the, I think the most critical point with that, with nominations is if we're, if you're at a point in the draft where nobody has much money left it, and you nominate for a guy for a dollar who you don't really want, you may win him for a dollar. So you have to be careful with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, there, there's a point where you can't throw any guy out for a dollar and trust somebody's going to bid you up to two. So that that could mess you up. But otherwise, it's it's not that big of a deal to me. What I did in, in the most recent one, the AL only one, and, and this could go for a mixed league. It's not an AL only specific thing. I noticed that for the first two thirds of the draft, everybody nominated was going for more than I had him projected for. So I was going for relative, I was, I was nominating relatively low end players that I didn't want and seeing them go for four, five, six dollars more than I had them projected for. So I was draining money consistently, uh, so that I could get the players I actually did want in that price range or even a higher price range of mid range guys for cheaper than I had them projected for, but just because so much money was used up. So a lot of my nomination strategy is based on what I see happening in the room. Uh, if 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 somebody tests the waters with a low end guy, or I don't know, let's say a mid range guy, a, a guy who I would project for ten dollars, let's say, somebody throws him out early when there's still a bunch of studs on the board, and he goes for four dollars, just because people are like, eh. I'm not really thinking about that yet. I, I got to figure out what my studs are before I consider that. Okay. Well, maybe it's a good time to nominate that guy, a guy you want yourself, because it seems like you could get him for cheaper than he's projected for. So you just kind of have to read the room and um, make your nomination decisions based on that. Uh, there are times when bidding activity has nothing to do with my nomination. and I just see that like my strategy depends on my ability to get this player. And a lot of players are being one who I might be interested in if I can't get this player, but until I get this player, I, until this player's gone and I see what he goes for, I can't afford to spend on those other guys who might be my fallback options. If all my fallback options are going before the critical guy has been nominated, I just go ahead and nominate the critical guy. Cause I, if 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 it turns out my expectations for him are unrealistic and I never had a chance of winning him, then I want players to fall back on. And if I wait until they're all gone, then you know I've given I've given myself nothing to pivot to. Let's talk bidding because I I think there is a psychology behind this. There is a, a strategy behind it as well. And obviously, it depends whether or not you're doing an auction online or you're doing an auction in person with people. But I like to change it up, Scott. I like to sometimes. I will let it go all the way down, going once, <laughs> going twice. Chris hates that. And then I'll bid. Yeah. And then, because to me, psycho like psychologically, it makes the other person think that, ah, you know, I was really thinking about it. I'm probably not going to go that extra dollar. And it just, it just kind of changes people's mindset. And, and other times where if there's a player I really want, I'll do that the first time. Going once, going twice, all right, I'll bid. Someone else bids again. I'll bid right away mm -hmm. and I'll just kind of like change up my cadence just so like people don't mm -hmm. know what I'm doing, you know, try to be a little right. bit predictable within the draft. Totally agree. Totally agree. If, if we've got a nice consistent volley going, you know, like, all right, 13, okay. 14, 15, 16. And we're just like really consistent tempo. I'll hesitate. It's just me and one other person I'm talking about. I'll hesitate to make them think, Eh, I'm not sure I really want to do this extra dollar. Okay, yeah. I guess I'll I guess I'll go in. I love it. I love it. And, and I sometimes love strategy, it, it legitimately is me hedging, mm -hmm. but they don't know. They don't know if I'm legitimately hedging or if I'm playing a game. And and but I'm trying to get them to slow their roll because they don't know exactly where I'm gonna stop. Um and you know, other times we'll have that consistent volley volley going quickly. I'm bidding them, they're bidding, I'm I'm bidding the guy up, they're bidding back. And I'll just abruptly stop and that'll be it. And they'll be stuck with him wherever he is. <laughs> yeah. So. Something I've noticed about uh, doing live auctions too. 
And uh, shout out to Ariel Cohen. He, great fantasy player. Great auction player. He will change the volume of his voice within a live auction when bidding on players. It's so interesting, but it it just does enough to throw people off a little bit. He'll yeah. scream out a number, and then he'll kind of say a number lowly and, and softly, and it'll just kind of throw people off a little bit. And next thing you know, you want a player for cheap. So it's like th there's definitely a psychological aspect to doing it in person too, and mm -hmm. it's really fun. And I, I like thinking about uh, that part of the game as well. Scott, talk to me about price enforcing. So how often do you find yourself bidding on a player who is going for less than they should, even though you really don't want to win that player? Well, not often. Occasionally. I, I think the important thing to keep in mind is you should never truly bid on a player just to enforce the price. If you bid on a player, you have to be prepared to win that player for the amount you bid, which of course everybody knows on an intellectual level, but you, you might do it assuming somebody's going to bid you up and it doesn't. I mean, the, the famous Jed Jerko story with Nando, <laughs> I don't know how many times I've told this story, but like great, I, great I went, story. I was going superstars and scrubs. This was when, this was when Miguel Cabrera and Mike Trout in some order were obviously the top two picks in fantasy. I won them both. I was doing a superstars and scrubs thing. I knew Nando was obsessed with Jed Jerko. The bidding just kept going up and I just, I don't know. I, I, I thought, I thought non cause Nando's always been like somebody who just has his guys and gets them no matter the cost. He doesn't really pay attention to what everybody else is doing. He just wants his guys values, his guys. And so I thought that's what he'd do with Jed Jerko. I think the price got up to like $24 and Nando just stopped bidding. And I, I had to win <laughs> Jed Jerko with my, I couldn't afford a, a splurge on Jed Jerko after spending like a combined, I don't know, $120, $115 on Mike Trout and Miguel Cabrera. Jeez. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I think I still finished fourth in that league. So it's not like it was a total disaster, but could have won that league, Frank, if I wasn't price enforcing. And um, ever since then, I've been hesitant to do it. It's more, when I do price enforce, it's more like, Okay, come on. This guy can't go for for 16. We can't have we can't have Rafael Devers go for $17 when when uh Alex Bregman went for 23 or whatever. Yeah. Might be an extreme example, but you get what I'm saying. We we got to get him up. Let let's keep going. I can't let you get this discount. But it's more when I do that it's not exactly what I've budgeted, but I can live with it. I can live with it if it turns out I I, I win Rafael Devers. I can make the adjustments to to still put together the basically the roster I want. Um, I think it's worth doing in that situation, but you have to be very careful with it. Mm -hmm. Last two pro tips, and uh, you can quickly react to them, Scott. Don't. Try to avoid bidding on the last player in a tier because that player, while it doesn't always happen, a lot of the times that player will go for more money than they should. So, for example, I think there's a pretty clear either top six or top seven starting pitchers this year. Let's say the other five, for example, are gone. The last player thrown out from that tier is Luis Castillo, let's say. There is a chance that Luis Castillo will go for more than a Kevin Gosman or a Zach Wheeler or maybe even a Corbin Burns. Because he's the last player of that tier and everybody else knows it. Now, there aren't always clear examples of the end of a tier. But I think an example like that, people kind of know and they realize, all right, well, this is the last, you know, SP1 or legit ace up top. And that player sometimes could go for more uh, than they should. Last pro tip, spend your money. You don't want to leave mm -hmm. with money on the table. It's just an awful feeling. Then you start thinking, mm -hmm. oh, well, I could have had this player if I went the extra dollar, blah, blah. But yeah, have a plan, but make sure spend your money. You don't want to leave the auction with money on the table. Look, if you have three or four dollars left left over, I I don't think that's as bad. Spend it all. I don't think that's as bad as having like ten one dollar players on your roster where you've you 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 spent it so early that you just had to take the settle for the dregs. You know, that's fair. 
Um, but yeah, yeah, certainly having like 12, 13, 14, that, that's a big problem if you have that much money left over. The tears thing, I don't know how true it is. I mean, there are certainly instances where there was clearly the last player of the tier and his value got pushed up beyond the others in the tier. But it's, it's, I feel like just as often, I've been like, okay, I'm going to bid on the second to last player in the tier because I don't want to be the one to bid on the last one. And, and he turns out to be inflated compared to the the actual last one in the tier. Reverse psychology. I don't know if it was intentional or if it's just the way it worked out. I, I'm less I'm less fearful of that, though, than I used to be. By the way, when I was saying $17 for Rafael Devers, I mean, I was, I was just pulling numbers out of thin air. He's got to go for a lot more than 17 Yeah. Um, I just wanted to clarify that because I was, I pulled up my auction values. Oh, I'm projecting Devers for 31. You, you got the point of what I was saying, regardless of the players or the amounts I used. Mm -hmm. Anything else, Scott? I, again, we could do a whole episode or multiple episodes on just this topic, but was there anything else that we missed that you wanted to make sure we mentioned on auctions? Oh, um, I, I, so usually as we usually as we said with auctions you're filling out your starting lineup and handling the reserve draft handling the reserve spots afterward so you have to be careful with that for instance an example from the AL only one I did earlier this week i was behind in stolen bases i had stolen base problems i saw four quality steals options in my mind out there. One of them was a middle infielder. One of them was DH only, Byron Buxton, actually. I I needed both of them to address the steals issue. And so that meant I had to leave middle infield and utility, my DH spot open. Because if I filled them with someone else, I mean, you can't fill bench spots in the auction usually. I'd, I'd just be prevented from getting them. So I had to pass up discounts I really liked, like Davis Schneider. Again, this is an AL only league. Davis Schneider went for $4, and I hated to see that happen. Um, J.D. Martinez obviously hasn't signed yet, might not wind up in the AL, but he went for $1. I couldn't bid two on him because I had to leave that spot for Byron Buxton to get those steals. And it it, it killed me in the moment. But I, I knew I needed those steals, and so I, I could not afford to, uh, to bid on the discount just because it was a discount. I had to focus on the needs, and I had to make sure not to block those spots. Uh, and I ended up winning both of the players I was trying for, for, for more money than Schneider and Martinez went for. Um, and again, that's an AL-only example. The league, the names may vary, but it's, it's, it's something that would apply regardless of the format. You have to make sure that uh not to not to block positions of players you need knowing that bench space is not something that generally applies to the auction and to your point too discipline right having that discipline to know all right look this is what i need while i really like david schneider he doesn't give me what i need so again there is I think discipline plays a big part in those drafts as well. We're going to wrap there for Scott. I am Frank. Thanks as always for tuning in to Fantasy Baseball today. Please make sure to follow and leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. And we'll be back again tomorrow. Bye-bye.